My name is John Thornton. Years ago, I taught linear perspective at a now defunct art school. I wanted my class to be both rigorous and practical. I was thinking especially of students who would become representational painters. As I enter my sunset years, I figure I'd better share a free online version of my class now while I still have the marbles to do so. Here's what I hope to cover. One point perspective. Two point perspective. Perspective grids. Equal spacing of vertical and horizontal line segments as they recede into the distance. The perspective of a roof. Three point perspective. Circles and ellipses. And finally, practical application and visual measuring from a setup. This last section is the most important part of my movie. Of course, there may also be some random topics and digressions that occur to me as I work on this. But first, a brief introduction. Linear perspective is a system invented by Italian artists in the 1400s that enables us to project an accurate illusion of our three-dimensional world onto a flat two-dimensional surface like a canvas or piece of paper. Artists before then understood that objects look smaller the farther away they are from our eye, but they couldn't quite duplicate the way our eye sees. But these Italian artists formalized the recession of space into a mathematically rigorous system. At its heart, linear perspective depends on two perpendicular lines, one vertical and one horizontal. The most famous horizontal line, at least if we are sober, is the horizon itself. Living at the Jersey Shore, I see it every day, but the horizon line is also the same as the viewer's eye level line. Notice how the horizon moves as I rise and fall vis-a-vis -vis my wife's stationary position. So you don't need to be at the beach to know where the horizon is. It's always at the height of your eye. The horizon line divides what's above you from what's below you. The other line, the vertical one, is known as the line of sight or central vertical line, and it does not have a real-world incarnation like the horizon. The line of sight is an imaginary vertical line that intersects your dominant eye and divides what's on the left and right of you. Here is my Nancy volunteering to look at a chest of drawers for me. Her line of sight would be located right through her eye. Depending on where she's standing, her view of the chest will change. Here, she's standing right in front of it, and it looks like this. She sees just the front and the top of the chest. If she moves enough to the right, she will also see the right side of the chest. Or if she moves enough to the left, she will also see the left side of the chest. I made a little sculpture to illustrate how the horizon and the line of sight intersects at the eye and how these things move as we do. I set up a simple tabletop still life and can show you where the horizon and the line of sight would appear from different viewing angles. How did I know where to place these two lines? Well, this sets up our next section, one point perspective. The intersection of the horizon and the line of sight is called the central vanishing point. If the front of an object, like this table, is horizontal, then the sides angle back in space and cross each other at the central vanishing point. So I traced the two sides of the table back to find where they crossed and then drew the horizon 
and the line of sight through that point. Okay, let's dismount from our bongo boards and begin one point perspective. Imagine a vertical piece of glass between the viewer and the subject. The glass is perpendicular to the viewer's gaze. If the viewer is an artist, he could trace what he sees right onto the glass. The piece of glass is called the picture plane, and the projection of the seen three-dimensional world onto the picture plane is the essence of Western representational art. These boxes are all drawn in one-point perspective. They are in different positions in space, but share one thing in common. The front face of each one of them is parallel to the picture plane. Each front face is drawn from horizontal and vertical lines. This table is positioned so that the front is parallel to the picture plane. I can place a box on top and rotate and move it around, but only when the front is parallel to the picture plane will we have a one-point perspective situation. One-point perspective was used extensively in the Italian Renaissance. Da Vinci's Last Supper is a powerful example. Notice the table is parallel to the picture plane, as is the room itself. I trace back two receding wall lines and find that the central vanishing point is at Christ's eye. The viewer's eye is directly across the picture plane from it, so da Vinci has us looking eye to eye with the Lamb of God, if you believe such things. Here is a quick freehand sketch of boxes in one-point perspective. To draw them more precisely, you need a straight edge and a pre-existing right angle. I like to use artist cards for that purpose. To make the horizon line parallel to the top and bottom of the paper, I will line the card up with the left-hand edge of the paper make two little marks, and then, using the straight edge, draw a line between them. Next, I want to draw the central vertical line, aka the line of sight. I will line up the edge of the card with the horizon line that I just drew. This makes sure that the line of sight will be both perpendicular to the horizon and thus vertical. Again, I'll make a couple little marks at the edge of the card and then connect them with the straight edge. Now I have these two very important lines, the horizon and the line of sight. I'm about to show you how to draw the front of a box. I'll start by drawing a horizontal line segment using the card to make sure it's truly horizontal. From the edge of this, I'll drop down a vertical line, again using the card to make sure it's truly vertical. And then another horizontal and vertical line. The importance of the card and its right angle are critical to do this correctly. You can't just eyeball it if you want it to be really accurate. I would get my students to do all these guidelines with a sharpened pencil, and if there was any kind of overlap or error, they could easily erase it. So now we have the front face of a box. It's parallel to the picture plane, 
ready to go to becoming a three-dimensional rectangular solid in one-point perspective. You'll notice that the lines we have so far are only horizontal ones and vertical ones. To complete the box, we draw back from the corners to the central vanishing point, which hopefully you'll recall is where the line of sight and the horizon intersect. So we have the front face of the box and three guidelines going back to the central vanishing point. I can randomly select a point on the lower guideline and erect a vertical using the card, of course, to make sure it is indeed vertical. And where that vertical line hits the middle guideline, I will complete our box by drawing a horizontal line. And of course, here too, I use the card to make sure it's truly horizontal. So here's our first rigorously drawn box. Note that in one point perspective, the edges of a box must be vertical, horizontal, or aimed directly at the central vanishing point. Those are your only choices in one point perspective. Knowing this, you can place your boxes anywhere you want in relation to the horizon and the line of sight. But depending on what quadrant you place a box, you will see different sides of it in addition to its front. For boxes that don't intersect either the horizon or the line of sight, you will see three facets. For boxes that do intersect either the horizon or the line of sight, you will see only two facets. And if a box intersects both the horizon and the line of sight, you will only see its front facet. If you align edges of your box with either the horizon or the line of sight, you've created what's called a tangent. And artists tend to avoid this, both because it diminishes the sense of three-dimensional space and, frankly, looks a little weird. Although the great Italian still life painter Mirandi did it all the time. Next up, two-point perspective. As you now know, both the box and the table are in one-point perspective when they are parallel to the picture plane and the horizon. But once we start rotating the box, it no longer has horizontal edges. The sides veer backwards into space. And there are an infinite number of angles that we can rotate the box until we get back to a one-point situation. Here's the basic MacGuffin. Receding sides for one-point boxes meet at the central vanishing point. Receding sides for two-point boxes need both a left and a right vanishing point. I'll show you more in a minute, but I first need to get on my bongo board and philosophize. The words vanishing point. What a wondrously poetic phrase, especially to a 71-year-old agnostic who feels that his own vanishing point is fast approaching. But what does it actually mean in linear perspective? In reality, parallel lines never intersect. They just go on forever with a fixed distance between them. Or you could say, they will cross at infinity. But to our eye, parallel lines 
that are moving away from us appear to intersect at a point. This point is called a vanishing point. We know that objects in one point perspective meet at the central vanishing point, the intersection of the horizon and the line of sight. But as soon as you rotate a box in one point, it will require two vanishing points, one to the left of the line of sight and one to the right of the line of sight. The bottom book is in one point perspective, but both objects on top are in two point perspective. Because they're tilted at different angles, they will have differing sets of left and right vanishing points. So how do you draw boxes in two point? Start by drawing a vertical line segment and then back to the two vanishing points. Add a couple more vertical lines to finish off your box. And also back to the two vanishing points. That's the basic idea. It's made up of vertical lines and lines that aim back to its set of left and right vanishing points. Okay, let's make a box with a new set of left and right vanishing points. In relation to the other two, this new one will be rotated a bit to the right. I think I'll draw a box in one point perspective, just to show that all these boxes can live in harmony in one world, regardless of where their vanishing points are on the horizon line. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Sometimes the boxes that you draw in these mechanical drawings will look a little distorted, and there's a variety of reasons for this, but I'm not too worried about it. My main concern is teaching you the basics so that when you draw from real objects, they look believable. All right, everybody ready to move on? Oh, Poindexter, I see you have your hand raised. Mr. Thornton, Mr. Thornton, your boxes are screwed up and you just said it was a variety of reasons. Well, can't you tell us those reasons? All right, Poindexter, I don't usually get into this level of detail, but I'll quickly show you why. Horizon line of sight. Next, we position what's called a station point on the line of sight below the horizon. This represents where the viewer is standing in relationship to the picture plane and the depicted objects. Next, I'll position a square with its bottom vertex at the station point. The square can be tilted at any angle. We're going to draw guidelines from the bottom sides of the square up to the horizon line. Where they cross the horizon line gives us our first left and right vanishing point. Now, if we tilt that square, the guidelines will move to the right and we'll get a second left vanishing point and right vanishing point. Here's an interesting idea. As we keep swiveling that angle from the station point, eventually we get to one point perspective again. When the left vanishing point is the central vanishing point, the right vanishing point is infinity. Chew on that a while, Mr. Poindexter. Now back to distortion. If you set your left and right vanishing points randomly, your two-point boxes may well look screwed up. But if you set them using a station point, that problem will go away. But there's something else that we need to consider. If we draw a 60-degree angle centered on the station point, that is known as the cone of vision. If we place our three-dimensional boxes within the cone of vision, they tend to look normal. Here I added a couple boxes outside of the cone of vision, and you begin to see the distortions. So, Poindexter, 
Use a station point and keep your objects within the cone of vision. Does that help you? Oh, yes, Mr. Thornton. Thank you, sir. I hope I grow up to be just like you. All right, class, let's move on. I'll show you how to do a perspective grid like a checkerboard. I'm going to draw a horizontal line and divide it into equal segments. From the ends of this line, I will go back to the central vanishing point. Then I'll draw another horizontal line to complete my rectangle in space. Next, draw guidelines back from each of the markings. This essentially will give us almost like a floorboard pattern. Now I can turn the grid off and we'll use it for measuring. And next I'm going to draw a diagonal. You'll notice that the diagonal crosses each of the guidelines. Now to finish the grid, I'm going to put a horizontal line through each one of those intersections. And here's what it looks like when you get rid of all the extraneous guidelines, etc. Perfect for your painting of a checkerboard. A train track going back into space has these wooden ties that are spaced equally. How could we draw something like that? Well, that's our next assignment. This time, we'll just start with a central vanishing point. We'll draw a horizontal line and from its endpoints back to the central vanishing point. Then we'll pick a point to place our second railroad tie. The two ties and their guidelines form a rectangle in space. Do the diagonals. This gives us the center of the rectangle. And if we draw a guideline from the central vanishing point through the center, we'll bisect each of our railroad ties. Now we draw a guideline through the end of the first tie through the middle of the second tie. And where that hits the guideline, draw a horizontal line and we get our third tie. From then on, it's the same basic procedure. From the end of one through the middle of the next, and then another horizontal tie. From the end of one through the middle of the next, and another horizontal railroad tie. And so on and so on until infinity, although you'll probably stop before then. If you wanted to equally space a bunch of vertical poles, it works exactly the same. You just tilt your paper to the right 90 degrees. But it's more interesting if you think about people, maybe soldiers lined up each one as tall as the pole. Let's say one of these guys gets called to fall out by a sergeant. As long as he moves horizontally, he'll stay in perspective. But what if you don't want to worry about any guidelines with people? You just want them to look like they're all in the same space. There's a trick called hanging a body part on the horizon. Notice how these guys are positioned so that the bottom of their crotch is right on the horizon. Here's the sergeant. Where do I put him? Well, doesn't matter how big he is. I'm just going to nail him to the horizon line by the crotch, and he'll look like he fits in with everybody else. Let's not forget the lieutenant way back out of harm's way. 
To learn more about this trek, watch my movie. Okay, class, you've been very patient, so I'm going to give you a little break. Show of hands, would you rather go back outside on our balance boards, or would you rather meet a very cute golden retriever? Wow, that's unanimous. Anyway, here's Jasper, a wonderful creature who knows perspective inside and out. To Jasper, station points and vanishing points are like kibble and poop bags, just part of everyday life. Next up, the perspective of a roof, or as Jasper calls it, the perspective of a... We'll start with the basic structure of the house in two-point perspective. I'll put a vertical line through the left vanishing point and then show the three vanishing points we have so far. This new one is a vanishing point for the roof. I'll place a second vanishing point for roof below the horizon. Note that it's exactly the same distance from the horizon line as the top one is. Now I'm going to draw a line from the front corner of the house up to that top vanishing point for roofs. And then from the bottom vanishing point for roof, I'll go through the back corner of their house and bring it up to where it meets the other guideline. That will be the roof peak. The roof line is parallel to the right side of the house. So from here, we go back to the right vanishing point. Remember, parallel lines vanish at the same point. Since the back of the roof is parallel to the front of the roof, this line will vanish up here. Geometry is sometimes redundant. If I draw the diagonals of this side of the house, and thus get its center, and then erect a vertical through that point, it will meet at the roof line. Well, I guess there's no place like home. Right, Jasper? Should we give our students one last thought about inclined planes? Notice how all the blue planes are parallel to the horizon and meet at the central vanishing point. The inclined red planes are parallel to each other, and they all meet at a vanishing point above the horizon line. It seems like Jasper is getting a little sleepy. That may be a problem for my viewers as well. So good news. Here's our last mechanical drawing, three-point perspective. When we are underneath something and looking up, or above something and looking down, vertical lines no longer will appear vertical. In fact, they will aim towards a vanishing point on the line of sight. In pictures like this, the horizon line is typically above the top of the canvas or below the bottom of the canvas, depending on whether you're looking up or down. We'll pretend we're in a helicopter looking down at some buildings. The pale blue rectangle is our canvas, and we'll start by drawing the tops of two buildings, one of them in two-point perspective, and the other one in one-point perspective. Now, normally our vertical lines would be vertical, but in this case, they're going down to this vanishing point for verticals. Notice that's way below the canvas, just as the horizon line is way above it. Three-point perspective is a little bit gimmicky in my humble opinion. I rarely use it, although I know a lot of artists love it. Now we can finish the bottoms of our buildings by going back to the relevant vanishing points. So here are our two buildings seen in an aerial view in three-point perspective. In this case, we were looking down. If we flip the drawing, we'll be looking up in three-point perspective. Because this happens typically when we're looking up at tall buildings in a city. Unless we're underground, we won't see the bottom of the building. Thus, 
the bottom of the canvas will crop that out. To get good at anything, you need to learn, practice, and experiment. Using a balance board takes some time. Watch and learn, Poindexter. Now you try. As Poindexter works at it, check out my little experiment working out the pages of a book in perspective. I soon realized that if a book is parallel to the picture plane, its splayed out pages would radiate out onto the edge of a circle. Even though they are slanted, two sides of each page, the red ones, do not recede into space and thus are perfectly parallel and have no vanishing points. The blue sides of each page do recede and all of them aim back towards the central vanishing point. This makes me think of circles. I, oh, Poindexter, what have you gone and done? Okay, come back to class. We're going to talk a little bit about circles and ellipses now. This is a circle. All the other shapes are circles as they would appear in perspective. As the circle is tilted away from your eye, it becomes skinnier and skinnier. Eventually, you'll see just a straight line. And then if you keep tilting it, you'll see the underside of the circle. Okay, let's go. Tilt, tilt, tilt back, keep tilting back. Tilt, line. We flipped, now we're looking at the underside and we keep going down and down and down and finally it returns to a circle if we're completely underneath it. Back when I was teaching, I had a student who referred to virtually everything as a bad boy. It could be a hamburger, or a convicted felon was a bad boy. So how do we draw these bad boy ellipses? You want to draw a horizontal line and then find its exact center. Through that center point, you're going to draw a vertical line so that the two lines mutually bisect each other. So that the distance from there to there is the same as from there to there. And from there to there is the same as from there to there. Then draw a perfectly symmetrical oval that hits at all four endpoints. And you can rotate it to your heart's delight and it will always look correct, as you can see in the tops of these flower pots. Now here's a cylinder, a fat hockey puck, if you will. And it's a little bit incorrect, but generally looks right. Now the reason this one looks a little more correct is notice how the bottom ellipse is a little fatter than the top ellipse, which is always going to be the case when you're looking down on something. As your viewing angle decreases, the shape of a thing becomes skinnier and skinnier until it's aligned. Now it's time to share with you by far the most important practical concept that I learned in art school, visual measuring. It's a set of techniques that helps you map out the three-dimensional world onto a piece of paper or canvas. For years, I told students that even if they had never drawn before, if they applied the visual measuring techniques with care and patience, they could begin drawing accurately immediately. Of course, that was easier said than done, and I almost gave up believing this until one day I had a student from Korea. She had never drawn before, but took my words to heart, and it actually worked. Visual measuring is about finding the relative sizes of things and the angles between things. We'll start with sizes. You may have seen an artist holding a pencil out at arm's length with his thumb near its top. He's looking at the thing he's trying to draw and is positioning the tippy top of the pencil on something and his thumb on something else. 
Here is our lovely model, Nancy. If I were drawing her, I might start by getting a visual measurement of her head. I'd put the tip of the pencil at the top of her head and my thumb at her chin level. I'd then move the pencil down so that its tip was at her chin and make a note in my mind where the second head length would cross her body. In this case, right at the middle of her breast. The third head length looks to be about where her belly button might be. And I can continue this until I get to the bottom of her feet. So Nancy measures at just over seven head lengths. Say I wanted to fit her entire body from there to there on a piece of paper. I begin by guessing. I use my fingers as calipers. If the size I guess is too big, I'll have fewer than seven head lengths. If it's too small, I'll have more than seven head lengths. When I get fairly close, I'll put my measurement from my caliper hand onto a little scrap of paper. I'll make two tick marks. And then I'll measure it down and see if I'm right. And again, you keep doing this until you get it exactly right. It doesn't really take very long. And this tick mark method allows you to avoid any arithmetic, like dividing 11 and 3 eighths inches by 7 and marking that off on a ruler. Forget that. Visual measuring is not about the absolute distance from the top of the pencil to your thumb. It's about the ratios of different parts of the visual field to one another. I can also turn my hand sideways and measure horizontal sizes. I can compare the width of her head to its length, which looks to be about four-fifths of one head length across. The width of her shoulders is about one and three-quarters head lengths. And across her body at the bottom of her sweater, it's two and a fifth head lengths. From the farthest points across her shoes, it's one and two-fifth head lengths across. I decided to make Nancy's head a little bigger in my drawing. Her whole body won't fit, but that's fine. It'll be about three and a half head lengths. I'll make the markings on my sheet of paper where the head lengths will go. I'm going to sketch a little center line for her head. I'm going to turn my little scrap of paper sideways and measure off four-fifths of a head length. Remember, that's the width of Nancy's head. And I'll center that around my guideline and draw a few tick marks. And this is going to give me a rectangle in which I can draw her head. It should fit just about perfectly in terms of its width and height. Now we've been using her head as our unit of measurement, but we can measure just about anything. We can measure the distance from her chin to her eyes and see how that compares to the distance from her eyes up to the top of her head. And we see that her eyes are right in the middle of the height of her head. I'll compare the distance from the outside corners of her eyes to the width of her mouth. Looks like her mouth is only about half as wide. You can compare almost anything using visual measuring. Here we see that from the top of her head to the bottom of her sweater is just a bit smaller than from the bottom of her sweater to the bottom of her feet. Now clearly this is not the most spontaneous way of drawing things, but it is incredibly accurate if you do it correctly. And what I'm about to say is absolutely crucial. The distance from your eye to your hand must remain fixed, and the distance from your hand to your subject also must remain fixed. So make sure your measuring arm is absolutely straight. 
This will keep the distance from your eye to your hand consistent. And use tape on the floor to mark where you're standing or sitting so you will always be in the same position. If your subject is a live model, tape her or his feet as well so they get back into the same pose. We can also use visual measuring for angles. I can hold the pencil vertically and see where the head lines up with the balance board's roller. Or twist it sideways to find out that the bottom of this hand is just below the top of this chair. I can also capture angles, like between the hands, or the board. Let's say I was going to draw the top of this table. When you're trying to get an angle, you must make sure that your hand is like the hand of a clock. It twists sideways, but it doesn't go back. Our tendency is to sympathetically want to go back like that for angles that recede into space. Don't. Hold it vertically and just rotate it sideways. Pretend there's a piece of glass and you can't press through it. Once you've got that angle, you can go over to your piece of paper, let's say this was a piece of paper, and just make a mark like this. And so you're reproducing the angle perfectly. So let's try to do a practical application of all that we have learned. Here's a simple setup, and we will try to draw the shapes of the top of the table and the top of the book. We'll get a piece of paper and make sure it's standing up parallel to the picture plane. This helps when we are trying to reproduce angles and don't want to have to reach down if the drawing pad is on a table. We will start by getting the angle of the front of the table. It's horizontal, which we know, incidentally, means that it's going to be one point perspective. We come over to the paper pick where we want the front left corner of the table to be, and draw a horizontal line stopping where we want the right front corner to be. Next, we will get the angle from the front left corner to the back left corner. Come over and draw it through our front left corner point. We are not worried about the size of this line, only its angle. Now we'll do the same thing for the right side of the table. Next, we get the vertical distance from the front of the table to the back. This will be our measuring unit, like Nancy's head was when we were drawing her. We will turn the pencil horizontally and see how many of those units are required to span the front edge. It looks like eight. Now with our scrap paper and tick marks, we'll keep guessing until we come up with the exact size we need. If our guess is too big, fewer than eight will go across the front line. If it's too small, more than eight will cross the line. Once we have that distance, we can place it vertically with its bottom on the front edge. The top is where the back edge of our table should be. The back angle of the table is also horizontal, and so we'll draw a horizontal line through the top of our measuring unit. Now for the top of the book. We need to get both its size and its position. Using our measuring unit, we see that the front right edge is about one and four fifths units. Now we need to locate the front vertex. Lining up our measuring unit, we see that it's about three-fifths of the way up. But where is it horizontally? We can measure its distance across and see that it's a bit closer to the left side of the front of the table than the right. We could also carefully measure how many units across it is from the left-hand side of the table. But I'm going to eyeball it. 
Once we have the position of this front left vertex, we can copy and then draw the angles receding from it the same way we've done before. To find the right front vertex, we'll use our measuring unit and get a 1 and 4 fifths distance. So now we have the front two angles and the front right side. We'll copy and draw the back right angle of the book. To get the back edge, we're going to get the angle between the front left and the back right vertex. We can copy and then draw that angle on our piece of paper. Where these lines cross is the position of the back right vertex. Next, we copy the angle through that vertex and draw it. Erasing lines that extend too far, we are left with a pretty darn accurate drawing of these two shapes in relationship to each other and to our eye in perspective. But don't get too cocky. We better check to make sure there are no errors. Let's extend our table edges back so that we can find the central vanishing point and thus the horizon line. Now we know the book is in two-point perspective, so let's check where the left vanishing point is, which we know has to be on the horizon line. It looks like I didn't quite make that back right edge tilted enough. To make it vanish on the horizon line, I need to angle it in a little bit more, which is easy enough to do. Our drawing, which had been pretty darn accurate, is now pretty darn darn accurate, or pretty pretty darn accurate. Learning the fundamentals of linear perspective and mastering visual measuring is very helpful, but it's no substitute for the countless hours of drawing from real life that serious representational artists engage in. So join a drawing group today and get cracking. There's an irony to what makes drawing so difficult. Our brains are exceptionally good at understanding the three-dimensional world. We know that this shape is a square, no matter how it appears to our eye. So knowing its shape, we try to draw that shape, even though the shape that we see is not a square, but a skinny trapezoid. Here are some common errors one sees all the time in student drawings. The room, the table, and two of the boxes on top of the table are in one point perspective, but they all have different horizon lines and central vanishing points. This box, in two point perspective, has a horizon line much lower than anything else in the drawing. If you look at the table and this box, we can determine that the line of sight is somewhere around here. And yet this box, in one point perspective, shows its right hand side, which is impossible because it's to the right of the line of sight. Now let's look at the two elliptical forms. Notice how the top ellipse on this is much fatter than the bottom ellipse. Since the bottom is farther from our eye than the top, it should be fatter. The hockey puck has that problem too, but it has another one as well. Look at the top ellipse. The sides come to a point. It's like a canoe instead of a well-rounded oval. Visual measuring allows us to bypass what we know and put down what we see. Oh, and a final tip to make your visual measurements even more accurate. Instead of using a pencil as your measuring device, pencils are kind of thick. Consider getting a wire hanger and cutting a section of the straight part. It's much thinner and it won't block as much of the model behind it. I hope this movie was useful 
And as Poindexter learned with his balance board, regardless of what you're trying to learn how to do, practice makes perfect. Right, Jasper? <laughs> <laughs>